So we're going to continue our discussion of monetary policy and the banking system and how the banking system works. Uh, and we started that with tools of the Fed. But in order to understand the banks and how the banks create money, you, you have to understand what a bank is. And I, I briefly went over that. A bank is a financial intermediary, which means it brings together savers and borrowers. It collects savers' money. It pays them a certain interest. And then it lends money out to borrowers. And it charges them a higher interest than they pay their savers. So it's a very old, stodgy, as long as you're doing it right, it's just like you print your own money and it, it's a win-win all around. Um, the savers win because they have a way to uh, collect interest instead, not just stick money in, in their couch and it doesn't earn any interest. They can earn interest on their money. Borrowers win because they have access for an uh, of an affordable way to collect money to, to borrow money and start up or purchase something or they have access to funds where they never had access to that. So savers win, borrowers win, the bank wins, it's creating money, it's, it's generating wealth, it's creating jobs. So it's really a, a huge economic invention, a win-win all around. <clears throat> the way it works though is you have to understand what a fractional reserve banking system is because we, we dropped that uh, a couple times and I wanted to explain what that was. So Fractional reserve banking system goes back to medieval Europe, all right? And in medieval Europe, goldsmiths used to keep and maintain gold for, for depositors, okay? So what they would do is the depositors would give goldsmiths their money, and they would make sure they would assay it, which says make sure is it 12 carat, is it 24 carat, what, what percent purity is the gold, and they would hold it for them and protect it for them. Uh, a while later, and they would give them receipts back. They would say, you have, they didn't have dollars, but you have $1,000 worth of gold at, you know, John's Goldsmith. So they knew, all right, my gold is protected, and I, at any time I can use this receipt and come back and get my gold, all right? So later on, the Goldsmiths realized, well, first of all, society realized real quick that it was quicker and easier to use these receipts as money instead of carrying expensive and risky gold coins everywhere. So what they would do is, instead of you know purchasing a $1,000 item, they had to buy a sword or something like that, they could either give them the gold or they could say, look, you know John's goldsmith. You know He's right down the street. I have my money here. If I give you this, it's the same thing as giving you the gold. And basically, over time, these receipts became used as currency instead of coinage. Right? And they were the kind of the first paper money, uh, but obviously it was local. Now, fast forward a couple of years, the goldsmiths realized something. Depositors very, very rarely came back for their gold. They usually deposited and very rarely withdrew. So they realized in any given week, month, or year, their stockpile just kept increasing and it never decreased. So they realized what I could do is I could issue – paper receipts in excess of what I had in my account. So if I had, you know, a million dollars in gold in my account, I could issue $2 million of receipts safely and not stress my reserves at all. All right. So that is what effectively a fractional reserve banking system is, is if a bank gets um, $10 million in receipts in deposits, all right, the bank owes that back to the depositors. But what the bank can do is it can lend out a vast majority of that. All right, it can only keep, if I have, what did I say, $10 million in deposits in the US right now, effectively, I'm loaning out 9 million of that. And I will only have a million dollars in either vault cash or reserves to pay out my depositors at any given time. So I keep only 10%. I'm, I'm legally required to only keep 10%. They might keep excess reserves above and beyond that, but legally, according to the government, I'm only required to keep 10% of all deposits. I can loan out 90% of my deposits, hence fractional reserve banking system. I only have to legally keep a fraction of my money, all right, in any given time, all right? And it works, 
it works. So effectively, banks create money in that respect. And I'll, I'll go into more detail. But if I, if these sticky notes are are deposits, and Mr. Krause deposits a thousand dollars with a bank, that bank goes. It keeps 10%. It just keeps a few of those. And it loans out 90%. So 900 of my $1,000 goes to a small business loan or a home loan. So if I want to collect my $1,000, they're going to have to take it from other parts of the reserves. All right? So that's, that's how it works. And it works really well unless you have something called a bank run. And a bank run is where as you've seen from this, uh, the toilet paper issue going on right now, people are kind of lemmings. So if all the people like kind of talk with each other and they realize, hey, I heard the bank is not doing so well. And everyone at the same time, more than 10% of my depositors come back for their money, all of their money at once. I don't have that money, right? I only have 10% of my money. If 50% of my depositors come back, I literally don't have that money. I loaned it out. So that was one of the weaknesses is a bank run can severely strain and it's a flaw in the fractional reserve banking system. So what they did uh, after the Great Depression kind of really exploited this, this flaw. What they did was they created, if I can open it up, the FDIC. All right, so the FDIC is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. All right. It's a government corporation uh, to go back to to gov. The FDIC is a government corporation. And what that does is that protects your money in the case of a bank insolvency or a bank run. So the banks in 1930s, because they effectively broke the economy, they had to fix it. So it required all banks to deposit into this FDIC. So every bank that, that I know of is covered by it's insured by the FDIC. What that means from a depositor standpoint is that their money is insured. It's an insurance thing. So if that bank goes bankrupt, up to $250,000 per bank, my money is protected. So if I have $100,000 in my savings account and that bank goes bankrupt, I will get paid out every dime by the FDIC. All right. And that's what it's there for. That's the whole point of it is to make sure Americans are comfortable with the fractional reserve banking system and they trust banks again because after the Great Depression they had a lot of trust to build back up. <clears throat> so that's what the FDIC does. It protects Americans in the case of a bank run. Uh, and it, it works because in, in 2008 uh, my mom lives in the Keys. She had money in a, in a Keys bank. It went under. It was one of these small banks that didn't make it through the Great Recession. They got paid out every dime. So it does work. Um, so that's fractional reserve banking system. That's how it works. That's what a bank run is, and that's what the FDIC is. Um, so we're going to go into a little bit more of specifically uh, in terms of the balance sheet, how a bank creates money. Uh, but this is probably a three-part video. So this is part one of banking and how banks create money. I'll send another two via Kraus University website here on YouTube. And enjoy it and keep studying. I hope you guys do well.